Reading from the Old Testament, this is the story of Moses approaching the mountain of God. Exodus 24, beginning in verse 12. Listen for God's word. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? We thank you, God, that you call to us, that you meet us where you are. You bring us to places so that you may shine and we shine through you. Open up your word for our hearing and our understanding. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Mountains are beautiful, and then you have to climb them. Our son, Donald, graduated from college some years ago and immediately took a ride across the country with a group that was called Bike and Build. There were 25 young adults, and they rode from Newport News, Virginia, to Cannon Beach, Oregon in 10 weeks, stopping along the way to advocate for affordable housing. In order to prepare for that trek, Donald was told, ride your bicycle. Ride daily, go on long rides, work up endurance, take in hills, include some mountains. But mountains are hard to find for Floridians. (laughs) The average altitude range for Florida is 100 feet above sea level. The highest spot on this peninsula is in Lake County part of the Lake Wales Ridge, which is like a spine that goes down the middle of the state. It is 312 feet above sea level. Donald did take in some hills around Tallahassee, and he biked Sugarloaf Mountain with Walk Jones, but only once. When he took off with a bike group from Newport News, His experience of hills and mountains was scant. Donald's first real mountain was on day five of his trip. He biked over Afton Mountain on the Blue Ridge Parkway right after leaving Charlottesville, Virginia. Afton is just shy of 2,500 feet. That was seven times higher than any mountain that Donald had biked to date. He was not in Florida anymore. I asked Donald to tell me about it as I read the story from the gospel lesson today of Jesus taking his disciples to the highest mountain. Donald said this, On Afton, the roads are not graded. So it was straight up and over and exhausting to climb. On a bike, you slow down so that you have to use all your strength to push one pedal down and then the other, so on and so forth. I think it's more challenging than just walking when it's that steep. You are so focused on each pedal and expending your energy that you can't pay much attention to the environment as you climb up. 
but you gain momentum even as you go the same speed. And the farther up you get, the more determined you are to finish. I think at all stages your attention is not so much else on, than on the task or scene before you. You are truly present. At the top, the awe you feel is the only feeling, not many other thoughts, probably because you're exhausted. It's a full body experience, different than just driving up a mountain and seeing everything. I imagine, he says, it could feel the same way to experience the blinding light. By the time you reach the top, you are exhausted. However, the vista you see is so exhilarating and powerful to behold, you can't really comprehend much else. Metaphorically speaking, we at Park Lake have been on a mountain for a few weeks, at least through our worship scripture texts. In Matthew, we know this series of scriptures that we've been studying as the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus literally takes them up a hill that is going to serve as their classroom. Jesus is teaching his new disciples about what it means that the kingdom of God is coming and that the kingdom of God is here and what that kingdom looks like and what they might be watching for and who really is going to recognize that kingdom when it comes. The mountain in literature is often a metaphor for a place that is set apart. Matthew tells us that the mountains are places for prayer, for healing, for feeding. They are places of teaching, of worship, for testimony, for meeting the resurrected Jesus. The mountain is the place where change happens. One of the most meaningful experiences for our youth who attend the Montreat Youth Conference every summer is to climb the trail that is Lookout Trail, Lookout Mountain, at, and they've begun to do it at dawn so they can experience the sun rising just as they reach the peak. The youth take off while it is still dark. The first part of the climb is a well-prepared path, but it is dark. The second becomes steep and rocky, and the final ascent is nearly straight vertical, and they have to practically crawl over boulders to get to the final path. What awaits them on the summit is a breathtaking sea of light coming up over the surrounding mountain ranges and spreading over the valleys below. It is a view that they are willing to make the difficult climb for year after year after year. Six days previous to this morning's story, <clears throat> Jesus' conversation with the disciples is beginning to change. The lessons that they have been learning about on the mountain, the new way of understanding God and the world and their role in it, takes a shift Jesus was teaching parables, he was healing, he was feeding crowds of people, he was verbally sparring with the leaders of the temple. All that Jesus did and said was powerful and compelling, and the disciples began to get a glimpse that Jesus was unlike any other teacher they had heard before. But then his focus changed. And his lessons changed. And his lessons began to be about Jerusalem and suffering and losing his life and quite possibly the disciples losing theirs as well. And the conversation among them went silent. Six days later, they went up another mountain this time, Jesus takes three of his first disciples, Peter and James and John, and immediately when they reach the top, like the sun at daybreak, 
Jesus transfigures right in front of them. He changes, his body changes, his face shines, his clothes become dazzling white. All the synoptic gospels tell this story almost all in the same way. That's unusual. It's important. They want to say, pay attention. This is a significant story. The most historically important prophets appear with Jesus. Moses, the great liberator of God's people from slavery in Egypt. Elijah, a prophet who confronted an evil empire almost single-handedly. The three were having a conversation. Luke is the only one who mentions possibly, specifically, what the conversation would be about. Luke says that they are talking about Jesus' suffering in Jerusalem. Now I ask you, can you imagine being one of these disciples face to face with, first of all, with giants of the faith, otherworldly beings. And their friend, Jesus, now is, is taking on a holy otherness. The disciples should have been speechless. But then Peter interrupts. And Peter has this great idea. Peter interrupts this significant moment between Jesus and Moses and Elijah because he has this great idea that supersedes any great thing that they may be discussing. Hey, Jesus, why don't we all stay here? I'll build you houses. It's comical, it's embarrassing. And it's maddening all at the same time. It's so Peter-like. We preachers have built sermons around Peter's habit of being obtuse, of speaking before he thinks, of taking off with harebrained ideas, presuming that he knows best of only half listening. We like Peter, and we like to laugh about Peter because he is so relatable. Maybe we are Peter. You've heard that quote, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. That's what we've preached. But Here's a hidden gem I I read this week from theologian and pastor Jason Michelli, who says, get this, Jesus does not correct Peter. This is the only place in the Gospels where Jesus does not tell someone they're wrong. Jesus does not... Tell Peter he's wrong. Here on the mountaintop, the only instance in the Gospels where Jesus does not respond at all to something that someone has said to him. I wonder, does Jesus not respond, Michelle says, because, in fact, Peter gets it right. Even if he doesn't know exactly what he's saying, what he gets right is that gazing upon Christ who is charged with the uncreated light of God is good. Not only is it good, all the sermons to the contrary, it is the essence of discipleship. It is the core of following Jesus to see the divinity of God inside Jesus himself. In this very image of the transfigured Christ, Peter sees the life of all lives flash before his very eyes. In one instance of transfigured clarity, Peter sees the humanity of Jesus suffused with the eternal glory of God. And in that instant, 
Peter glimpses the mystery of our faith, that God became human so that humanity might become like God. And this is where the good news is to be found. Peter sees who Jesus is so that we might become like God. That's what Peter eventually learns. The light that radiates Jesus' flesh is the same light that said, let there be. It is the same light that the world awaits with groaning and labor pains and sighs too deep for words. It is the light that will one day make all creation a burning bush, a fire with God's glory, but not consumed by it. This is his mountaintop experience. Peter is right. Peter gets it. Jesus is God, became man. God is here, and that makes all the difference for us. Michelle says, this is the mystery of our faith. Only when we get this are we ready to do the work of ministry. Are we ready to serve God in the world? The entire Christian life is a sort of ascent, venturing further and further up the mountain to worship and adore the transfigured Christ, and in so doing to be transfigured ourselves. And if we're not transformed, what's the point in going back down the mountain. We'd be down there, no different than anyone else, which leaves the world no different than it's always been. With all the blessings and woes and the talk of being salt and light and of trudging up the mountain with Jesus for healing and sermons and teaching, we've been in the process of being changed We ourselves, the goal is to be transfigured by the power of Christ's spirit right before our very eyes. We've been learning how to be the people of God, the disciples of Jesus, and called into the world to be different from the world so that the world might see God through us. Don't be in such a hurry to go back down the mountain at least not before you've experienced the presence of God in front of you. That's what should guide everything else you do. Donald adds this, and then you start the descent, and the thrill on the way down is a lot of fun. You feel full. And after that, I was used to the rhythm of biking mountains. And so, Lent begins with Ash Wednesday, about as low as you can go. Lent is sure to present its own mountains and challenges for you but it also brings the possibility of getting into the rhythm of seeing Jesus for who he truly is in your lives and being transformed by it. May it be. May it be so. Amen.